Stray Light is affecting my favorite spacecraft, while Hubble is being allocated to help out New Horizons. But to do what? Hello space fans, welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. With just over a year left until New Horizons arrives at Pluto, the Hubble Space Telescope has once again been called into action to aid the mission. The New Horizons spacecraft launched in January of 2006, and since then, Pluto has been reclassified as a dwarf planet and four additional moons have been discovered. So what's Hubble going to be doing? Well, New Horizons is a flyby mission, meaning it won't be orbiting its target like Cassini does with Saturn. This leaves a great opportunity for New Horizons to achieve, to survey Kuiper Belt objects. The Hubble Space Telescope Time Allocation Committee has given the green light to observe areas in New Horizons' flight path to look for these cold and icy objects beyond Pluto. Now, KBOs are small and dark, but Hubble has the ability to detect objects that are relatively large, which would be prime candidates for New Horizons to visit after it leaves Pluto. Kuiper Belt objects in New Horizons flight path may be no larger than the Isle of Manhattan and have very low albedo, meaning that it's not very reflective of light and even more difficult to see. That being said, the New Horizons team has already made it past a giant hurdle, successfully convincing the time allocation team to grant them time on the Great Space Observatory, as it's extremely competitive to get time on Hubble. As data from Hubble comes in, I'll make sure to let you know if they found somewhere for New Horizons to go after Pluto. It'd be pretty awesome to see a Kuiper Belt object up close. Most of you know by now that I absolutely love the Gaia mission, where the goal is to observe 1 billion stars and create a 3D map of our neighborhood in the Milky Way. It's such an ambitious mission, and I personally think you need a pulse check if the chance to have a map of our place in the galaxy does not excite you. As with most attempts to push back the horizon of known knowledge, speed bumps and roadblocks present themselves, and we have to find ways to overcome them. So a, a few issues have arisen with Gaia, and its team has been working diligently to adjust. First of all, Gaia is far fainter in the sky than originally estimated, appearing at magnitude 21 instead of 18, meaning that it's difficult to get a pinpoint position using the 1 meter telescope designated for the task. Instead, astronomers have shifted to using the 2.0 meter Liverpool telescope and the 2.6 meter VLT survey telescope, while adding radio interferometry measurements to the mix to solve that problem. Now secondly, water deposits have proven to be problematic as water ice is built up on the mirrors. This ice occludes the mirror and thus interferes with the light reflected off of it. Now this is something that was anticipated, but the team did not expect so much water ice to be there. The mirrors of Gaia are equipped with heating elements that allow the water ice to reach a temperature that causes it to sublimate out in the space. A decontamination campaign of warming the mirror has been done successfully, resulting in transmission levels that are nominal for the mission. But the amount of water ice might have also caused other problems. You see, there's a lot of stray light being observed by Gaia, which means that as it's attempting to detect very faint objects, this light bleed adds noise to the signal and is difficult to differentiate between faint star data and the anomalous light. It's believed that there are ice deposits on the thermal tent of Gaia, reflecting diffracted light from our sun, contaminating the data that's arriving in on the spacecraft's 106 CCD detectors. The decontamination campaign that removed the ice from the mirror was thought to also remove any ice from the thermal tent, but that appears to not be the case. Either that ice is still there, or there's another cause for the stray light to be reaching the mirrors. The team has been running multiple simulations and have experimented with replicas on the ground to reproduce the anomalies by adding ice to the same black paint that's on Gaia's thermal tent. There is a plan in place to change Gaia's position slightly to allow more direct sunlight to enter in and reduce any remaining ice in a way that will be safe for the equipment, but it's not been implemented yet. Now this is because no hard evidence has been found that shows any amount of ice layered in the thermal tent would be causing this stray light to enter in, and thus going through with this type of decontamination session might not be worth the risk. Now even if the issue of stray light isn't solved, this does not have a huge impact on Gaia's primary science mission. It only affects the accurate detection of the faintest stars within its survey, resulting in it being measured to 6-8% to instead of the acceptable 4% while the brighter stars are still very accurate to 
So it's okay to exhale now. Nothing catastrophic has happened to Gaia. The team has already done an amazing job overcoming obstacles, and those remaining, even if unable to be completely corrected, have very little impact on its scientific goals. Now, I don't know about you, but I could use a pick-me-up after going over the difficulties of Gaia. Like many of you across the globe, we get some of the delicious caffeine from espresso and Italian astronauts are no different. They've had the need for espresso neglected for over 13 years, but this will soon be rectified. The Italian Space Agency has teamed up with Lavazza and Argitech to bring the first espresso and coffee machine to space. Its name is ISS Espresso, and a lot of research and development has gone into how to make the delicious drink in microgravity. Yes, that's right, aerospace engineers are using their knowledge of physics and fluid dynamics to deliver fresh espresso to people in space. Now that I think about it, I wonder what previous missions would be like with fresh espresso on board. <laughs> so to find out more about the ISS Espresso and the other stories in this week's episode, check out the links in the description below. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. I want to give a big thank you to all of us who joined us for last week's Hubble Hangout on the Frontier Fields mission. We'll be joining up again on Thursday to discuss the absolutely gorgeous release of the Ultra Deep Field in Ultraviolet. Make sure to tune in. Also, later that evening, I'll be on Dr. Kiki's This Week in Science show to bring on some space fan news to the mix. If you don't already follow and subscribe to Twist, make sure to do that now. It's going to be a blast. If you want more space fan news, make sure to subscribe. We are on Twitter at Space Fan News and also have our Tumblr up at SpaceFanNews.com. Thank you all for watching and, as always, keep looking up. Thank you.